Hello everyone, uh, uh, your teacher in this class, have, I think she told you yesterday or in the past days, uh, teacher Benjamin and I, we asked her for this hour so we can present our final results of our research in this research that uh, some of you participated, well, I think most of you participated in this study, right? So I think uh, teacher Benjamin is just sharing the sc his, his screen and he's showing uh, the presentation in PowerPoint, right? So we have, this is the name of a research project. Uh, we, I, we decided to put it in Spanish because that's, that's how this project was approved last year, January last year and we're just concluding with this study in December this year. This project was approved by the Dirección de Investigación y Postgrados. We received some budget for attending some congresses and conferences and for other things. And in the second year, uh, Dr. Silvia Rodriguez Narciso, she helped us with some statistical analysis. Uh, she won't be with us today, right, because she's busy doing other things, right? So can you continue with the next slide, Benjamin? So basically these are the four objectives of this study and in the last objective this is basically the reason why we're presenting to teachers and students of the VA and the department uh, these results. We're, we're trying to disseminate our results with as many students and teachers as possible and fulfilling this fourth objective in our project, right? Next, please. So to show you graphically, uh, one of the objectives of our study is we wanted to look specifically at writing development in terms of accuracy, complexity, and fluency. And we wanted to join that the idea of writing development with different types of errors, specifically syntactical, morphological, and lexical errors. And so again, one of the main purposes for our study was to share our studies with, uh, share our findings with, um, with a group from the BA, so to help inform pedagogical practices um, and for all of us in the BA to reflect on how we can provide better feedback to the learners and how learners at this particular level, in fact, you all, uh, since you were the ones who participated uh, in our study, how you all at the level of a B1 to B2 uh, interacted with your own writing development and the different types of errors that you experienced at that time. We do want to throw out and, and say that we really appreciate all of your participation um, that that you helped us with in the study, because obviously we could not have done this without your participation. So uh, just a quick note of gratitude to you all for, for helping us uh, with the study. Now, to provide some context here, theoretically, uh, we were looking through the literature and we found a lot of studies on uh, researchers who categorized types of errors in terms of syntactical errors and semantical errors. And there was a lot of good reason to do that because they were able to look at how these different types of errors were reflective of different cultures, right? So some, a lot of these studies were from around the world and it's useful to look at these two different types of errors um, and try to draw some uh, some description, description around the types of cultures that were typical uh, of those types of errors. But we later decide that, decided that for our purposes, it made more sense to look at all types of errors under the umbrella of a semantical concept, right? So everything is a semantical error, 
but for our purposes, we divided up the errors in terms of syntactical errors, morphological errors, and lexical errors. Okay, so for our purposes, we wanted to categorize all of the errors that we found within these three categories. So when we look and we identify the term error, we're basically uh, using Richards and Smith's definition, the use of a linguistic item in a way in which a fluent or native speaker of the language regards as showing faulty or incomplete learning. It's important to mention at this point, we're not making a distinction between a mistake and an error. We're not uh, looking at um, you know, making a distinction between if this is a permanent error or not. We're just using it very loosely in this case, something that is of non-standard, uh, a linguistic item that is considered non-standard. All right, so we looked at, again, uh, classifying errors. Um, the first category here, syntactic errors. These types of errors are going to include like missing words, sentence fragments. Um, for our purposes, uh, run-on sentences came up and a lot of comma splices. Okay, so these are some examples of different syntactic errors that were uh, relevant to our study, of course, but also uh, was found in the literature. Morphological errors would include, for example, plurals, noun plurals, um, uh, number agreement, looking at countable, non-countable nouns would be considered morphological um, uh, elements. Errors in verbal morphology, tense, subject verb agreement, passive formation, errors with articles and determiners, right? So if there are issues or problems with articles, that would, those would be also examples of classifications of uh, morphological errors and also errors with prepositions. Finally, we have lexical errors and primarily for the purposes of our research, these are gonna be categorized as word choice or word form, the form of the word or the word choice. It's important to mention with regard to lexical errors that we made a distinction between words that were used incorrectly that interfered with the message, that interfered with meaning, versus words that were used where it didn't interfere with the meaning, but they might be considered awkward or non-standard, right? So we did make that distinction, and I think that's an important one, and we'll see a little bit later some of those results. Now, we're also looking at accuracy. So all of these uh, types of errors, right, syntactical errors, morphological errors, lexical errors, are all related to accuracy. But besides looking at the individual errors, we were also interested in looking at uh, ratios and being able to uh, look at and evaluate the writing of someone in terms of accuracy but assigning a, a formula to it, right? So we're looking at accuracy as the ability to be uh, free of errors while using language to communicate in either written or speech. But we're gonna look at it, we're actually going to put a ratio to that for, um, so that we can compare that to complexity. So complexity, uh, the development of grammatical complexity is progressively more elaborate language and of greater variety and syntactic patterns. So for our purposes, we'll look at what we mean by complexity, looking at different types of clauses and uh, T units. We'll look at that here in a second. And fluency. We also wanted to look at fluency, how many words basically were created uh, in this particular study and how many words were written in the essay, for example. We wanted to compare not only accuracy, but also complexity and fluency so that we had a better idea of the context so that we're not just looking at accuracy, we're not just looking at 
uh, lexical errors and morphological errors and syntactical errors that we're also looking at complexity and fluency together in order to have a better idea of the writing context of the, the writer or the, the writing development of the learner. Now, T units um, relates to complexity. So for T units in the literature, a clause is uh, basically a phrase dominated by a verb phrase or a subject. Those of you who have had us uh, in writing class, in grammar class, a clause is going to have um, basically a subject and a verb, right? And we have different classifications here between independent clauses and dependent clauses. And we have different categories of dependent clauses as listed here. Relative clause, subordinating clause, and nominative clauses. Now, it's important to define a clause because our definition of t-unit, this is basically our unit of analysis. This is how we are uh, coming up with the ratios for accuracy, complexity, and fluency, where we need to use uh, T units for a unit of analysis. So a, a T unit is defined as a main clause plus any subordinating clause. Or if you want, it's defined as an independent clause with any dependent clauses that are attached. So as, a, as an example, a simple sentence would be considered one T unit. A compound sentence has two independent clauses, so that would be considered two T units, even with no, um, with no dependent clauses. That would be considered two T units. A complex sentence would be considered one T unit, because again, it has one independent clause and one dependent clause. And a compound complex sentence with three clauses is going to be, uh, is going to be an example of two T units, two main clauses or two independent clauses with one dependent clause. Okay, so this just, whoops, this gives you kind of an example of uh, how we figured the T units. And in a few minutes, when we look at the results, this, uh, this is what we're referring to when we, uh, when we compare and use the T unit as our unit of analysis. Okay, now we'll talk about the study itself, the method section. Okay, Luis, if you want to continue. Yeah, Luis, I don't know if you have your mic muted. We don't hear you. Sorry. Sorry about that. It always happens to me. So the research question is related to what Dr. Stewart just uh, explained, presented. What are the salient syntactic, morphological, and lexical errors encountered by second semester students of a BA in ELT in composition writing? And the method is basically 31 uh, participants in this uh, bachelor, bachelor of Arts in ELT, 12 males and 19 males. And as Dr. Stewart said, uh, this, uh, at that moment, the learners were supposed to be in B1, B2 level, according to the common European framework of reference. And the mean age for, 20.75, the range 19 to 25 years. Uh, the instrument that was used was basically asking the participants to write uh, an essay in a, in a 15 minute period. And basically the topic was friendship and the procedure was uh, to explain, to tell learners to write an essay, uh, a narrative basically showing them a picture of two persons that were hugging, and basically that was it, right? And also an online questionnaire that participants responded to, 
and we got in demographic information there and also linguistic profiles, which uh, we'll, we'll explain later on. Uh, also, and this part is in Spanish because uh, the doctor that helped us with the analysis for the correlations, she doesn't speak English. She's a doctor in the <laughs> Departamento de Estadística and she started helping us out with this gen in January this year. Uh, so here it says that usamos un modelo lineal generalizado de Poisson, es uno, uno, uno de varios modelos para correr relaciones entre las variables, variables eh, independientes y la, y, la variable de, y la variable dependiente, y obviamente a través de este instrumento que fue en línea, que ahí definimos el perfil lingüístico oral, el perfil lingüístico auditivo, y el perfil lingüístico historial de acuerdo a las respuestas que nos dieron en, en, este, en este cuestionario que lo aplicamos en línea, ¿sí? que me hicieron favor de contestarlo. The questionnaire about demographic information and linguistic profiles. El paquete estadístico que se utilizó o el programa fue Software R Core Team versión 2013, esta es una versión gratuita que se encuentra en internet, es muy parecida a el, el paquete estadístico de SPSS, que es un paquete muy común entre los investigadores, y, y aquí estamos resaltando eh, las variables independientes que se utilizaron en el estudio para definir los perfiles lingüísticos, Las letras Q corresponden al número de preguntas del cuestionario. Por ejemplo, Q1, gender, Q2, number of times per year that you talk to, you, to friends or family, and so on and so on. I don't know if you guys remember this questionnaire, but it's basically the one that you responded, right? So we have these 10 questions here, and from here, which has uh, pair some questions and from there we came up with these linguistic profiles. That's that's what we did, right? This part, Dr. Benjamin, is this you or me? Yeah, I'll uh, present if you want. Um, so, okay, continue. All right, so this survey study, um, as um, Dr. Luis Humberto was mentioning, it's, it's a correlative study and it's a quantitative study. So we weren't collecting any uh, qualitative information. It was all quantitative. And so, let's see, did I lose our... I think we just lost the presentation. Can you show it again, please? Yeah, sure, let me pull this up again here. Try this again. All right, so hopefully you can see now presentation and let's go find where we were. Okay, so the data analysis part, all right, so we took the essays that were uh, created and we analyzed it in terms of accuracy, complexity, and fluency, again, to provide greater detail. We wanted to compare our study because most of the studies that we found were mainly focused only on accuracy. Okay, there were a few studies that actually focused on all three and um, less studies even specifically to uh, English language learners who are, were Spanish speakers. So we have here the errors um, pertaining to punctuation and spelling were ignored. Okay, so it's important to mention that uh, with the exception of commas, splices, and run-on sentences, um, punctuation and spelling errors were not part of our study. Here we have a list of different types of errors and their definitions. All right, we won't go through all of these, um, but uh, many of us uh, in the BA use a very similar coding system, and uh, many of the errors that are listed here are part of errors that you probably have uh, discussed with your teachers over the uh, course of your uh, stay here at the university. 
Now here's a little bit more of a detailed look uh, because for this study, we actually dug a little bit deeper in classifying the different types of errors. Um, for example, word form, you'll notice one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different variations of word form. Um, we wanted to look very specifically at the different types of word forms um, so that we didn't miss anything that might have come up. Um, but you'll see here uh, some examples of the code, the type of error, and some examples of the errors within context and uh, the correction. Okay, so these are some examples of some of the errors that we came across. Here's another way of looking at or categorizing the different types of errors. See, we have uh, the syntactic errors as word order, missing word, run-on sentence, comma splice, sentence fragments. Okay. And here again, we have some examples and ways of correcting these. And same way with lexical errors, wrong word versus word choice. Again, we wanted to make the distinction with lexical errors between those errors that would interfere with meaning, for example, wrong word, versus words that were awkward but didn't necessarily interfere with the meaning, we categorized those as word choice. Okay, Luis. Okay, Luis, if you want to continue with uh, this slide. Sorry, uh, here's an example of one of the essays that one of the participants wrote. And what we want to show you is uh, what exactly we did with each essay, how we proceeded to uh, identify the errors and what else we did with it. So in the following slide, as you can see, this is what you're going to look at uh, the 31 essays that we collected. So you, you can see actually this. It was, it was hard at the beginning for us to decide how to go about each of the essays for accuracy and then complexity and fluency. And one of the first things that we did was uh, we agreed to uh, write uh, the number line for, for every single paragraph so we can be talking about the same thing. And then we agreed on proceeding with identifying errors and underlining them and writing the code on top of that, right? So then later we will do this accuracy analysis, complexity analysis, and fluency analysis. It's important. So here, I'm sorry, uh -huh. uh, Luis, if I could just jump in real quick. I think it's important to mention at this time that both of us individually went through this process that uh, Luis Humberto is uh, sharing with you here. We each went through the process to uh, determine errors and do all of these classifications. And then we came together, compared notes, compared our analyses, and then reached an agreement for each of the errors that were included in our analysis. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Benjamin, for that. That's very, very important, right? So here in, on this slide, we have just an example of one paragraph taken from the essay that you just saw, uh, because this is clear. And here you can see the errors that we identified, and we underline those errors. And then on top of that, we, you, you just see in red the codes that we use for the error correction. So, for example, the first one, we have the capital letters A-G-R-E-E. -E. That means subject verb agreement. So, obviously, the correction here is helps because support is a singular noun. It's a singular subject. And the same for the rest. I don't know if you guys have any questions about this uh, identification of errors and codes that we used. Um, no teacher. No questions? All right, so we proceed. 
Uh, Luis, uh, can you advance the slides yourself, or do you want me to continue advancing the slides? So it is not advancing? I'm not sure if it's advancing for everyone, but I'm having to advance myself uh, to each slide. So. Oh, I see. okay. Thank you. So let me do it myself. I thought it was I was doing it. So. So this is the essay. This Excuse is. Excuse me. It is advancing. Go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, okay. So, so for me, it wasn't advancing. I don't know. I'm not sure so why. It's not that's fine. It's not advancing in your computer, doctor. <laughs> <laughs> as long as everyone else can see it, that's the mo that's the main thing. Pay, pay your electricity bill, please. I know, I know. Details, details. <laughs> so this is what we did with the essay. This is an example of accuracy, and then this is an example of complexity. What you see here is. Uh, how we identify the T units, which is the the unit that we use for the analysis of com of accuracy, complexity, and fluency. And then in this slide, you have uh, the identification of clauses, and then clauses, all the clauses in each T unit. That's what you see here, right? So we counted all these T units, and then we proceeded with the analysis we, which we will explain in a few minutes, right? Continue, Dr. Benjamin. All right, so here we have now uh, introducing our results. The first step was to uh, figure out, categorize all of the errors, and uh, we reached a total a number of errors of 901. So each error that is included in our study, we came together and reached a consensus and an agreement on each one of these. And you'll notice here, listed uh, with the most popular uh, error along the top, we have word choice on down to run on sentence. All right, so we have the frequency for each of the error types and a percentage of the total, right? So this is a percentage of the total errors uh, for each of these most common errors that were uh, committed in our analysis. And you'll notice here, sorry, um, you'll notice here also, I don't know if I can go back here. You can or you can't? There we go. Can you, did I, can you see the results now, the prior slide? For what kind of errors? For the, for the total errors, do you see the list? Now, let me go back for you. Is there? Yeah, I don't know if I have to take over as presenter again. I don't, I'm not sure how. Yeah, you, yeah, yeah, you have to take over. Oh, okay, I got to take over. I'm not used to taking over. How about that? Do you see the total errors? <laughs> okay. Yes, sir, or no? Do you see the total errors? Yes. Okay. All right, so uh, the, the last thing I'll say here is you'll notice that we have... Uh, a letter designation next to each of the categories, right? So L is the lexical error, M, morphological, and so on. Okay, so we also categorized those types of errors as well. All right, let's go to the first graph. Wow. It's not moving. Okay, how about that? Syntactic errors. So here, hopefully you see a pie chart. And um, of the total amount of errors... 25% were categorized as syntactic errors, right? Or 222 total er uh, 222 errors were uh, categorized as syntactic errors. So you'll notice here that most of these were under the comma splice category or the missing word, but we also had some sentence fragments, uh, word order, and run-on sentences. You'll notice next to each, both the frequency and the percentage of this of syntactic errors, right? So again, 43% of uh, the comma splice were 43% of all of the syntactic errors. For morphological errors, we had a total of, uh, it's hard to read there, for 399 total errors or 44% uh, were categorized as morphological errors. So we had word form, verb tense, articles, prepositions, and agreements. And lexical errors, basically just two categories 
Um, but the only these two categories made up 28% of the total errors, or 251 total errors. But again, between wrong word and word choice. So even though these are only two types of errors, it really goes a long way when you think about the impact it has on writing development. It really makes a, a big impact in one's writing development when you uh, think about the words that are being used uh, in the writing development of a learner. All right, so the T-unit analysis. So as we mentioned before, a T-unit analysis is any independent clause with any dependent clauses that are attached that are part of the same sentence. All right, so here we have ratios that we wanted to consider, again, factoring in accuracy, complexity, and fluency. Each one of these three involves an analysis that, it, that uses the T-unit analysis. Again, this is our unit of analysis, the T-units. So for accuracy, the formula is total errors, again, 901 total errors, over the total T units. So this provides a 0.87. So what does this mean? What this means is that of all of, if for each T unit, there was an average of 0.87 errors per T unit. All right. So for example, it's typical for lower level students, let's say students in an A1, A2 level, they may receive a ratio of let's say 1.5 errors per t unit right so we would expect this number to go down as students uh, are are creating less errors as they're developing in their writing skill so 0 0.87 0 0.87 errors per t unit for complexity the formula is total clauses regardless of the type over the total t units so for our analysis for this study, we came up with 1.57. All right, so what does this mean? There were 1.57 total clauses per T unit. All right, so the proper use of dependent clauses is an indicator of text complexity. So as an example, if we can think of a simple sentence, we would have a complexity ratio of 1.57. 0.00. A compound sentence would also have a complexity ratio of 1.0. A complex sentence would be considered or having a ratio of 2. A complex sentence meaning one independent clause and one dependent clause. And a compound complex sentence a 1.5 ratio, which is very close to the result that we have here. Right, so if this helps, think of it in terms of uh, a compound complex sentence. That doesn't necessarily mean that there were a lot of compound complex sentences, but to conceptually think of for every two uh, main clauses, there was a dependent clause. Okay, if it helps to think of it in that way. And then finally, we have a fluency ratio. This is determined by the total number of words over the total T unit. So again, re remember that we're using T units throughout these three types of uh, written development, ways of expressing written development. Here we have, there is an average of 11.85 words per T unit. This is just a word count. And uh, we think that this is relevant in not only providing context in terms of comparing accuracy, complexity, and fluency, but especially for Spanish speakers where typically uh, when writing in the L1 or when writing in Spanish, typically the sentences and clauses and phrases are longer in nature when compared to English. The reason we're including these three again is to provide context so that we're not just looking at accuracy, but as teachers and learners, we're also conscious of how complex are we writing. If we're teaching writing, how can we promote writing more complex uh, text in, in, in the sense that we're including more dependent, I'm sorry, 
yeah, dependent clauses like relative clauses and subordinating clauses and noun clauses. And fluency, right? Fluency might be an issue uh, as writers are developing and making sure that, you know, the fluency is within a reasonable range. Luis Humberto. All right, thank you, Dr. Benjamin. So here we have the results of correlations. Again, this is in Spanish because this was the uh, the help we received from Dr. Silvia. And basically it says that el modelo lineal generalizado de Poisson muestra la relación que existe de las variables total de errores, errores de sintaxis, errores de morfología y errores de léxico con las variables independientes. El perfil lingüístico auditivo, es decir, el, las preguntas de las preguntas que se deriva este perfil son de las preguntas 6 y 7 del cuestionario demográfico. Es el que más influye en la disminu disminución de errores totales de sintaxis morfológicos y léxicos, seguido del perfil lingüístico oral y en, un, y en menor medida el perfil lingüístico historial. Esto se puede interpretar para la enseñanza de estrategias de escritura académica que la práctica de la habilidad auditiva en los términos que fue investigada en este estudio, el alumno se puede apoyar en ella para mejorar su escritura académica. Es decir, el, estas dos preguntas se enfocan en, como podemos ver aquí abajo, hours per week listening to the radio or watching television in English at home, and the other one, and the other one is hours per week listening to English online. Uh, this was uh, a finding that probably we were not really expecting because we were more expecting uh, that the questions about writing will define or will, will, give, will render this type of results. But the, uh, the, uh, the results for these two questions according to the answers of the participants and the correlations that we, that we ran with the, the dependent variable, they tell us that uh, the more time uh, a person, well, in this case, these participants spend listening, listening to the radio or watching television or listening to English to some uh, online program, uh, that helps them developing in developing their writing skills, probably because we think that they develop more vocabulary and in a sense, uh, they understand grammar better. So that's the highest correlation we found uh, in writing and with the linguistic profile for listening, right? I think it's uh, important to add to what we what we found that didn't uh, correlate, and you know things like whether you went to a public school or private school, or whether participants went to a public school or private school had less of effect than listening to, for example, listening to the radio uh, in English. Um, you know, speaking to family members in English, whether you had members at home yeah. that spoke English. All of these had less of effect than listening to the radio or watching TV or uh, just listening to English online. Um, I think that was really uh, an important and interesting finding, actually, to find what didn't correlate. And regarding correlations, it's important to re remember that correlations are not the same as cause and effect. So we're not implying that those who watched uh, TV online in English that causes uh, them to have a higher level of writing proficiency, that th these are just associations when we're doing these, this type of an analysis. All right, so this is uh, our references, that some of the references that we use for this study, obviously here, the keyword sources of information are basically this, uh, this study by Bardovi, Harley, and Bachman, they did something very similar. 
uh, the book by Hunt, who designed the T-unit analysis, who created this T-unit analysis, and then these other studies that we just had here in our references. This last reference, Wolf Quintero, Inaki, and Kim, they basically present different formulas for uh, doing different analysis of complexity, accuracy, and fluency, right? And then the other uh, articles or studies that we have here in our references. So basically, this is it, right? I don't know if you have something else to add, Dr. Benjamin. Uh, no, I just I want to thank Lolis, uh, of course, for letting us share this these our results with you. And again, those of you who participated, um, uh, we really no appreciate problem. really appreciate your 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 uh, participation. Um, if we have some time for questions, we're, we'd be happy to answer any of those at this time. Thank you very much, Lolis, for this space. Uh, this hour. no problem, teachers. Right. So, if you guys have any questions about this, is considering that you guys helped this last year, and we thank you for that. Please go ahead. Chicos, Dr. Luis Humberto and Dr. Ben, uh, they, are, uh, they want to know if you have any questions about this results, because you were participating in that research. Or anything you want us to go over uh, again, we can do that. I, I think they want to go and eat now. <laughs> yeah, it's, it is yeah. time to. They are starving. Maybe they're tired, right? Does anybody have any questions? Uh, Lizzie, Lizzie is saying something. How much did the question no Q7 and Q6 influence in the results? Was it Q7 and Q6? That is a question Lizzie is asking. Okay, so let me just. Thank you, Lizzie. This thing is not working. I need to go back to that slide, but then. Which slide, uh, Luis? The correlation? Yeah, with the uh, perfect right here, that one. Q6 and Q7, and Elizabeth Isabel is asking for Q7, well, for these two. These were the questions that influenced the most in the in the correlation in the results. The others influence uh, a little less, right? So that's why I said that, and that's what Dr. Stewart just explained at the end, that a correlation is not is not like a fixed formula for uh, something to affect directly something else. No, this is just an association. Uh, maybe this happened with this group, but maybe if we run if we run a replica of this study with another group, we might obtain different results for these two questions. When we ran the the correlations, you basically it's a it's a percentage, and usually correlations are, uh, for example, 0.45 or 0.98, right? It usually goes from zero to one, and so. For, for our purposes, what we found was, what well, we basically, there's a cutoff to what, um, what is statistically significant, right? So for, for correlations, these two variables, these two uh, independent variables uh, were, had the strongest correlations than any of the other uh, variables. And if you remember taking the, the uh, online survey, we had a lot of questions. And we looked at a lot of variables. In fact, we looked at more variables than we're sharing here today, more than the 10. And we looked at all of them. And of all of the variables that we found, these two stood out. They had the highest correlation when compared to the rest. And these also were statistically significant. So what this tells us is 
that what we can say is that these two factors, listening to the radio and watching TV online or listening to English online, that this does more than the rest. There's a higher association. Those who, who do these things, right, have, there is a tendency to also have a higher development in the writing skill. Okay, so uh, we, we share this with you both as future teachers, some of you are teaching now, that when you're working with your students and you're trying to build strategies and ways and habits for them that really have a high impact, maybe consider these as finding ways that they get into these routines of you know, listening to the radio or watching TV on, online that of uh, based on our study that there is a correlation between these behaviors these profiles right and the the writing skill you know the writing skill <clears throat> the writing skill is the most difficult difficult skill of of all of the four skills so <clears throat> we wanted to tackle this one skill because it's the hardest and uh, we also have some experience in the BA and so we want to inform all the teachers within the BA of this, of these findings in terms of how we can provide feedback to the learners in terms of habits that they can build and strategies that they can incorporate to help with this, with the development of the writing skill. Any other, any other questions guys about these findings? Our, Elizabeth is saying that, uh, so would you recommend listening to more things in English to improve in writing? Of course, because uh, the skills cannot be isolated. They're somehow integrated. The brain does that automatically. So by listening to something more consistently or every day, that will help you somehow, will help you to write better in English. How does that happen? Well, uh, we didn't investigate that factor here in this study. That will be an interesting question for, to investigate in a different research study. That will be uh, interesting to do that, right? But think so, of, yeah, and think of it like this. This is how I conceptualize it. Like if it, a listening, uh, listening is a receptive skill, right? Like reading. So... Presumably, students are listening to the radio and watching TV. They're watching something that they like, right? They're probably not doing it for a homework assignment. They're probably doing it on their own. Of course, we didn't ask this, but I'm, I'm assuming that they're doing this because they are interested in the subject matter or the music or whatever. So if for me, the takeaways are that is how can we encourage our students to listen as much as possible. We didn't get into reading, but I, there's a lot of research that suggests that reading is also a great thing to do to improve all of your skills, not just your reading skill. Listening, the listening skill, as you get better, does not just help you get better at listening. It also influences all of the skills. So this is, I think, the takeaway for us and our findings is really looking at the importance of this receptive skill, listening, and the impact it could have. We don't want to say, in fact, we can't say that it has a cause and uh, a cause and uh, an effect per se in our study, but there is an association, right? So again, our takeaway is really encourage students to, on their own, find those habits of listening to things that they enjoy in English, of course, so that they get more exposure to the language and that will have, we think that we see, we show that there is an association between that and the writing skill. So not to think of the skills as co totally separate uh, things, right? That we develop them very uh, individually. No, we're we're advocating here that the, it's an integration of the skills and the impact that they can have. Damaris Garnica is asking, what would you recommend us to listen to to improve our writing? Dr. Benjamin? 
one thing that that I'm doing this semester in my prope group, I have listening and speaking. And, you know, one of their, again, was the question about in general or writing? Sorry, just to clarify. Was the question? Well, uh -huh. Damaris, please go ahead. Thank you, teacher. Um, in writing. Okay. Okay. All right, so I'm, I'm kind of split on my answer here. I... My suggestion, especially after finding out about these results, is using podcasts. Um, and this is what I'm doing with my appropriate group. Even though I have listening, speaking, it's not a writing class, but this speaks to the associations that we're finding in our study, that if you can expose yourself more to, to, to language, to the language, informal language, something that is, uh, is of interest to you, that there is an association on the writing skill. So podcasts, all of us, most of us have cell phones. If you find podcasts on subjects that are interesting, interesting to you, um, that you're going to be more likely to listen more frequently to uh, content in English. And again, based on our studies, there is an association with doing that and the writing skill. I mean, I could say, yeah, find podcast on the writing skill, right? And that would be probably uh, more boring. <laughs> that would be less interesting. Um, and you might not, it, it may not be part of your routine. But if you found, I don't know, a cooking show, something that is of interest to you, something about music, whatever the topic or the subject matter is, if it gets you to listen five, 10 minutes a day, every single day, think of the impact it's going to have on your overall English development. And as a result, and this is, I think, something that we can say with more confidence now, having completed the study, that that will positively impact your writing skill, right? Instead of thinking it necessarily always as, okay, I need to find a podcast on how to write a formal essay and listening to that all the time, right? We're saying no, maybe find informal ways that something that is that is going to be easier for you to incorporate into your day-to-day -day habits. Thank you, teacher. You're welcome. Thank all you right. for the question. For the questions. So... If there are no questions, we can wrap it up here. And we just want to thank everybody and the teacher as well. Lolis, thank you very much for this opportunity. Yes. If you have any further questions, uh, you can always write to us to my personal email, which is lahrodri.gmail.com. Right. You can always ask a question and we'll be happy to answer your question about this presentation or about doing research in general. Thank you, teacher. Yes, All thank right. you, Lolis. And I've included my email thank as well. You. Um, thank if you. anyone wants a copy of the presentation, of course, too, we'll be happy to share that um, with you. And yeah, just let us know if you uh, have any other questions or you want to know more about the study. But thanks, everybody, again, for your participation. Lolis, thanks for giving us some time in your class. Thank you, teacher. And we really appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Thank, thank, you, thank guys. you, guys. Take care. Bye, guys. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Take bye. care. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>